Live from San Francisco, it's theCUBE, covering Oracle Open World 2016. Brought to you by Oracle. Now, here's your host, John Furrier and Peter Burris. Hey, welcome back everyone. We're live here in San Francisco at Oracle Open World. This is SiliconANGLE Media's flagship program, theCUBE. Where we go out to the events and extract the signal from the noise. I'm John Furrier, co-CEO of SiliconANGLE Media with Peter Burris, general manager of Wikibon Research and head of research with SiliconANGLE Media. Our next guest is CUBE alumni, Chuck Hollis, senior vice president of infrastructure at uh, cloud and, and storage. Welcome to back to theCUBE. Good it's to see you. It's always a pleasure. I always have a good time when I'm here. So the best part of having you on is you've seen the movie before, you've lived it on other teams. Uh -huh. You're now in Oracle, what now, two and a half years? Uh, one Three, year at Oracle. One, one year, year almost Oracle. two years, yeah. so, so. I'm not dead yet. So, <laughs> yeah, I, don't, I don't think you. <laughs> what does that mean? Let's explore that. <laughs> when you, will you be dead? <laughs> look, you're looking good right now. You actually look like you okay, working like out. you, like you, you know. So is it the country club here at Oracle? I mean, no, it's pretty, no, chairs no. spinning at five o'clock. Uh, I'm up early and <laughs> to bed late, and weekends included, right? Well, certainly Dave Donatelli's here and, and a team of people yep. really ramping up yep. essentially engineered systems, AKA hardware, yep. engineered in with the software. So uh, Both in the cloud and on-premises, In right? the cloud and on-premises, yep. clear end-to-end -end Oracle solution, which is will one, be optimized to run on Oracle? Um, or, among other things, yep. So to give us the update, what's the new announcements today? So Larry from sta on stage was very proud to talk about our new Gen 2 infrastructure as a service. And our belief is there's a gap in the market. Uh, we have people doing public cloud, right, which basically is start over, Azure, AWS. No chance of an on-prem solution. We have the uh, private cloud guys, basically a VMware shop. Um, infrastructure only, no pass, no nothing. And certainly not a lot of choices if you want to go to public cloud. We think that uh, Oracle's doing a good job of creating that third option. Here is a combined integrated strategy on premises and in the cloud, same technology, same set of capabilities, aimed at enterprise applications that basically works the way enterprise IT needs it to work. So this next gen two infrastructure as a service is kind of the first peak of this massive investment we've been making, making an entirely new infrastructure cloud that meets the needs of enterprise IT. So is this a reboot or is this an extension of where you guys were? Some were analysts were saying, not us, but I saw- oh, You never say that. I saw, well, they said, I was using their words, Holger at Constellation said, you know, it's a reboot of their other infrastructure service. So they're me implying, he didn't want to say a fail, implied a transition. I wouldn't say fail, it's more like a leapfrog. Um, Explain. Oracle got into this business software as a service. Rather than standalone SaaS packages, they worked on integrating everything tightly together to unify in your company. That was followed by platform as a service, aimed at nine million Java developers around the planet and everything they do. Infrastructure as a service was just made separately uh, about a year ago. Uh, we got into the market, we learned a lot of things, but we also realized that we could actually start over again. So if you look at the engineering team, up to about 400 people who are building this next gen IS, they're all ex-Amazon, all ex-Azure. This is not their first infrastructure cloud. And because they were handed a blank piece of paper and said, you can start over again, um, it actually is pretty exciting what they've done architecturally. So but there's got to be something Oracle's doing that's distinct. So, uh, just for, for any number of different yeah. reasons. Oracle has a lot of existing customers that are running heavy duty enterprise applications. Yeah, the, the tough stuff. The tough stuff. Yeah, the tough so, stuff. So talk to us about how the tough stuff yeah. is going to end up in the cloud. Um, I think you bring up a good point. You know, one way of looking at it now is like the easy stuff is gone. Desktop has gone to Office 365 and uh, those kids from college are playing with AWS. And maybe I've got some generic workload consolidation sitting in the back room with a private cloud. What about those hairy applications, the demanding databases, the in-memory analytics, uh, the big Hadoop workloads, where are they going to go? Well, what you see with our infrastructure as a service is that we're actually providing two capabilities. We can run all of those in our cloud using those exact same technologies that we're running on premises. Uh, you're probably familiar with products like Exadata. Well, you can buy an Exadata, you can use the Exadata in the Oracle Public Cloud, or you can consume it as a cloud machine, something we call cloud a customer, on premises. And I think that's an important differentiation. 
lot of this market is focused on consolidating generic workloads. That's only moderately interesting to us. To your point, what we're really interested in are the big hairy ones. Uh, as I joke, uh, these are the ones that have vice presidents attached to them, right? Right. Yeah, the ones that people really care about. And, and typically eight figures. Um, depends on the size of the company. Well, like Mark was interviewing a lot of people, uh, a lot of customers this morning, and some of them were not large shops. But even those partners, those partners that are yeah. serving those customers yeah. often have eight figures associated with their investment in Oracle as well. Yeah. Yeah. So it cascades out through yeah. the entire industry. It does, it does. But it's also, uh, I, I want to ask you this, Chuck, it's also uh, not only the applications that have to be brought forward, but we were talking about ageism and you know it's always better if it's new. But there's a lot of skills in the industry. Mm -hmm. It's not It's not a question of we want to bring them along. That's where, still where a lot of the value is being created. Yeah. So talk about how this third way is going to make not only yeah. existing customers and existing apps, mm -hmm. but is also existing skill sets mm -hmm. more rapidly develop insight and experience and yes. expertise right. with these new technologies. Yeah, I think that's very good important because any IT organization is only as good as their skill set portfolio. And I think anybody who's worked with IT kind of understands that. But by the same token, look at the portfolio. You walk into an average IT shop, here's the stuff that was built decades ago. Here's the stuff that's kind of modern client server three tier. Here's the new stuff that we're using containers and microservices. If you're going to be an enterprise cloud provider to that IT shop, you got to support the old stuff, you got to support the, the you know kind of current stuff, and you definitely have to give them a pathway to the new stuff and give them the ability to uh, evolve that portfolio and people's skills forward at the same time. This is one of my big arguments with most public cloud providers is public cloud is easy. Just blow everything up and start over in our cloud. Well, as attractive as that might sound, that may not just be a financial reality for you know, the majority of IT organizations. And operationally too, they can't run their business. So let's talk about some of the container stuff. Uh, Ravello is a new container cloud service. Uh, uh, is that two things? So we have okay. a Ravello and we have a new container cloud service. So a little quick bit on Ravello. So we all know how hypervisors virtualize hardware. Ravello virtualizes hypervisors. What it does is it comes into a vSphere or KVM environment, lifts it up, strips out the hypervisor, encapsulates the network, the storage, and the compute, and then you can actually choose your cloud. Do you want to run on AWS? Do you want to run it on Google? Or do you want to run on the Oracle Cloud? And it'll show you the prices for each, and you can shop there. Yeah. So uh, the reason we think that's interesting is nobody really wants to get locked into anybody's cloud. And if we can give people uh, uh, workload uh, portability for VMs, that's great. Well, that's for stuff that we wrapped with virtualization. What about the new containerization? Well, the trick with containers is container management. And today, if you want to do container management, you've got to grab some open source stuff and basically build your own. What Oracle has done is created an end-to-end -end container management service that says, all right, if you really would like to build your own, have at it, but in the meantime, here's something that kind of works. Uh, we can do that on-premises on our cloud machines. We can do this in the public Oracle cloud. We have this vast burning desire to do this in other people's clouds just as soon as we get our own stuff sorted out. But it's the same thing. You know, if I'm developing an application, you know, Oracle has to go compete for that infrastructure business. It can't just say, well, you're an Oracle customer, you have to run on our stuff. And it would be the rare IT leader that would accept lock-in at the cloud level. Yeah, it's, there's yeah. no reason to do it today. Yeah. There's absolutely no reason to do it that uh, way. I, they may choose to go with us, but... But, but even if they choose to go with you, they want to do so in a way that doesn't force the lock in. We all flew here. Did you pay attention to the uh, flight attendant when she showed where the exit rows are and everything? You may not plan on using that, but it's nice to know, they're, nice there. To know where they are. Yeah, nice to know where they're there. And it's nice for you to know where they are, too. Yes. Because, yes. look, you guys, you guys have learned yeah. that to stay at the vanguard of the industry, yes. you have to be always aware of who's about to eat yeah. your lunch. And, um, you know, I think the Oracle database did a good job back in the day, and still to this day, of being portable. You can invest in the database, and it can go wherever you want. And we're trying to do the same thing for that application ecosystem. We're trying to do it for all three categories, the old legacy stuff, the somewhat, you know, contemporary stuff, and the emerging containers, microservices-based stuff. So talk about your partners, because I know that's something that we've been talking about in the Cube a fair amount this Partners, morning. we got lots of them. Infrastructure partners in particular? Well, yeah. Accenture has an announcement. There's a disco party going on behind us here. There sure is, and uh, <laughs> I'm sure it's very, unfortunately the Cube sign's in the way, otherwise I could participate in I it. I can see. But come back to this notion of a lot of the value that has always been created in the Oracle ecosystem yeah. has been created in partners. I 
have this theory, we have this theory at Wikibon that ultimately there will be more examples of cloud suppliers being created by your customers and your partners We're already than by today. individual like AWS and Oracle and Microsoft. So Oracle's always had a very rich partner ecosystem, from applications, to development, to infrastructure. And the exciting thing that I'm seeing with our partners is like they're seeing opportunity. So let's say that you have this cool vertical application. Five years ago, you were selling on-prem hardware with all that entailed. Now you can run that in the Oracle Cloud and simply sell a subscription service to your customers. You've evolved your business model forward. Um, the folks that we partner with do application development. They have a platform now for application integration where they have vastly more capabilities as opposed to the old school, got to go build it, got to go assemble it, et cetera, et cetera. The people who are feeling a little threatened by all this, not surprisingly, are the box shifters, right? The guys who just move hardware from A to B. And we're working with them, it's like, there's still opportunity there. You just have to look up the stack a little bit. Right. Your skills are still valid. They're just right. not assembling And you guys, hardware Accenture together. announced that the business crew's taking the infrastructure to service products out. That press release went out today. Yeah, yeah. Covered that. Um, I didn't know if that went out yet, but thanks uh, for confirming. I think <laughs> oh, maybe that was embargoed. Oops. Uh, uh, but here's well, Accenture thing. announced roll back, tomorrow. Roll back, roll back. <laughs> but no, it's, Put it's that back in the model, live TV. You know, Accenture, all these guys, they want to provide more value to their clients, and you know, 10 years ago that was stitching together hardware, now it's about teaching them how to intelligently consume cloud. And I think what these partners like about the Oracle offering, it's designed to work the way enterprise IT works. It's not this, hey, here's our model, take it or leave it. Um, it's very so, complete offering. One more thought on this, yeah. that there's a difference between the traditional, as you said, three tier, Infrastructure, yep. client server, yep. database, all the middleware, all that, yeah. And some of the new analytics stuff that's on the horizon. Yeah. Talk about how you guys are specifically focusing on some of the new analytics applications that are on the horizon coming into the cloud, yep. and how you intend to make the two worlds mm -hmm. work better together. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I think that's great. You know, old school analytics, we used to call data warehousing and business intelligence, that hasn't gone away. Uh, if we look back five years, it was all about big data and mining value. Now we're moving to a phase of real-time decisioning. Welcome to in-memory analytics, things as fast as they can be. And once you figure out how to monetize data, it's addictive. You just want to do it faster and faster and faster and faster. Also, we're talking about relatively exotic infrastructure, right? right. Multi-terabyte memory spaces, uh, shared new architectures, pretty hard to go down to Best Buy and find the heart for that and go build that. So as people start pushing the envelope, they're looking more for either on-prem engineered solutions or more often, what can you do for me in the cloud? Interestingly enough, we've talked about this Gen 2 infrastructure service. One of the things it's very good at is having enormous memory spaces and very fast compute, this kind of bare metal compute that we're seeing real-time analytics. You know, I think the other vector on this is Internet of Things. Forgive me for playing BuzzNet bingo, um, you know, buzzword bingo. Um, the easy part is gathering the data. The real-time decisioning and actioning on it, that's heavy compute. And delivery with control. Yeah, delivering with control. Uh, you've got 10 million gas meters. Okay, how do I reason over that in real time, right? That kind of thing. So I got to ask you, we've been hearing about the Spark-based exadata. What's all about, what's that all about? Is that the new product? All about? Um, another member in the family. So you guys probably know the, high, the headlines on the Spark chip. It has a couple of unique talents. Uh, it's got 32 encryption processors so it can encrypt in real time, no delay. It has this ability to take queries and run them in silicon. And it also has the ability to compress and decompress memory for in-memory analytics. So the Exadata uh, is basically a purpose-built engineered system for database. So by taking our processor technology and putting it in this purpose-built machine, it gets a whole bunch of new talents for no more money because, it's, again, that's part of our differentiation. The things I've learned since I've been a year at Oracle is it's nice to have your own chips. Sometimes they come in very, very handy as you build differentiated solutions. So I think Exadata customers will have a new option. And I'm sure in the fullness of time, it'll be available in our public cloud, it'll be available as a cloud machine. Well, this brings up a good point though. Uh, Intel was on stage yesterday, gave the same old corporate pitch, didn't really learn anything new there, but... They have nice slides though. But they, <laughs> and Diane <laughs> Bryant's awesome. But the thing is that Larry said that I find compelling is, now I'd like to get your thoughts on it because it kind of comes back down to the hyper-converged trend, which is he said, we are going to provide it faster and cheaper. So he's clearly looking at infrastructure as a service. Yeah, yeah. Bring this thing down, cost down to zero if possible, 
while performance he wants to bring up to a whole other level. Yeah, and How think, are you guys going to do that? What's the um, strategy? You know, I think uh, Larry and Oracle have the ability to invest like crazy. Don't forget, we build our own hardware. We build our own servers. We build our own data center fabrics. We don't have to buy this stuff from anybody. We build it. So uh, Larry and the team, a couple years ago, set this team up on a mission to go compete. Now, if you've looked at a Amazon AWS margins, you know there's a lot of fat there. They're also running on really old stuff. The basic architecture was designed 10, 11 years ago. You know, I don't want to throw aspersions around, but you could call it legacy cloud, right? Anything what do you call it? Legacy cloud. Anything 10 years or older, it's got to be legacy. Um, so there's a clear opportunity to go build something new. Now, that being said, this is a big boys game. This is not, let's round up a couple million dollars of VC and build a new cloud. So if you look at the aggregate spend that Oracle is putting behind this infrastructure. Well, even some of the big boys that are public, like Rackspace, they couldn't make it, right? So you're starting to see they, they were a little kind of a big boy. I mean, uh, they're reasonable out there. But look at it this way. Oracle's got a national software franchise, much like Microsoft does, to bring people on. We build our own hardware. We build our own data centers. We actually can become a vertical supplier in this, and the argument is efficiency's result. So we're going to see Dave Donatelli on Wednesday after his keynote. I know he's prepping up for that. How's it going with Dave? What's going on with Dave? Ah, see. Dave's having a good time. I mean, we all came to Oracle on the same premise, is that the industry was rotating. And I think we've seen that in some of the analyst numbers. Less and less on-prem spend, more and more spend in the cloud. And a lot of new hires, too, coming in. Oh, yeah. From industry that we know, yeah. non-Oracle, uh, yeah. pre-existing players. And if you asked them five years ago if they ever would end up working for Oracle, they might have not said so. But here's the You're thing. You're being polite. They said, no freaking way. I've never no, I know Oracle. Um, Go through your mind and think, what of the traditional on-prem IT vendors can transition their customers to the cloud? And it ends up being a very short list. And some of the ones that so I- Should you buy the whole cloud broker, Dell Technologies? Um, they don't have a cloud. I think customers want to consume cloud. They don't want to- The Cloud Air Network now has 4,000 cloud providers. All slightly different. <laughs> All slightly All different. working together with hypervisor. Yeah. Uh, Looks like a big portfolio a, management company. Is that a chess game or is that just Hail well, Mary? My personal view, vSphere was designed for the data center. Yeah, you know, EMC bought them 10 years ago, the architecture map, it was designed for the data center. And it wasn't designed for a world where people don't want data centers anymore. So I think VMware is very challenged because of their technology and business model is standing up viable public cloud options. Uh, the last big one was, oh no, we can't do it, we'll go to IBM. You know, what's your cloud strategy, VMware? All IBM, that's kind of a that's kind of a rough deal on a sales call. Um, well, if you, if you put in kind of the vCloud Air network, you could argue that this, they're giving up the cloud. I mean, basically VMworld, they said, we're done with the cloud. Look, I mean, they look, yielded. Look, don't you agree? I don't think they said that, Joe. They yielded, they weren't going to have their own cloud. Absolutely, they yielded. They um, yielded on not having their own cloud. Okay. They yielded and... On their own cloud, that's what I mean. Nothing more than kind of a boutique offering. And certainly there's a market for small regional service providers around the world, right? No argument there. And there's a natural tendency. But, you know, as I look at people going to cloud, the sticking point isn't the hypervisor. The sticking point is the database and the applications, the middleware. This is something Microsoft has done brilliantly with Azure. Microsoft, Larry pointed out on his earnings call. Yeah. Microsoft's well ahead of Oracle on the migrating their uh, install their franchise, base their franchise. into the cl yes, their cloud. Yes. And at the Oracle's end of the day, early. that's what you guys have to figure out how to do as well. We're well along the way. I'm sure. But my point is that without that franchise, that's a tough road to hoe, right? Yeah. You know, the infrastructure guys, maybe. The application well, guys are the ones you want to talk to. Well, Peter said, I'd like to get your thoughts on a comment Peter made on our intro with um, Matt Eastwood from IDC. Everything's on the table. Yep. Ecosystems, channel partners. So and we're shaking the table as hard as we can. If you have <laughs> the gravity, and, they, and Oracle thinks of the world as a suite, yep. which I think is a little bit orthogonal to the way the cloud is, but I get the language mm -hmm. of Oracle, the suite. It's a gravity around the suite. Yeah. It's not a winner-take-all. Win winner you got to be able to pick off pieces and they have to stand on their own. You build an ecosystem around that. Oh yeah. An open ecosystem. So that's that means the new lock-in spec is stickiness or pure performance. Um, I think or not, am I um, getting that right? I think Oracle's going to try to play on both sides. If you appreciate the value of the suite, the, the IAS working with a PaaS, working with a SaaS, great, we have all those pieces that can choose. Um, Larry made it pretty clear. You want to go head to head on IOPS and memory and cores and dollars for whatever? Oracle intends to feed on that as well. So, I mean, it'll be interesting to see how this plays out. Nothing like a low price to get an IT buyer. Well, he said on the earnings call, it was interesting, he was, he was, he was overselling in my opinion. I've heard Larry, Larry 
earnings call. I can't imagine. Larry was overselling on their earnings call, but I don't think the analysts understand the. the they don't understand the long game. If you look down the the, the twenty mile okay. stair. It's just even, hasn't even started for Oracle. Larry is a master at the long game in, in ways that I'm just now starting to appreciate. Uh, well, look, let's, let's be honest. What is the most sticky thing in the industry? Application Your applications. Yep. That's the stickiest thing in the industry. After that, the developer ecosystem, and then you come, then they get down to the hypervisor, and you get down and to the person. Yeah, yeah, and then you get into the wires that connect it together, right. and all that kind but of stuff. But the most yeah. sticky thing is the businesses are still run around some of these core applications. Well, that's why I brought the sweet angle because I think I think the developer angle is sticky because agility has proven that not everyone can build a killer app. So, for instance, within HCM, there's probably some feature of HCM that is subpar relative to some genius entrepreneur that eats, breathes that one feature but, as an app but, that could be in integrated into that feature. But here, yeah, I think that's your point. And with a platform as a service offering, oh, you want to add it, do something different, great. Yes, exactly. It's all about continuous development, continuous integration, yeah. but that continuity still is close yeah, to the Yeah, ecosystem to me is, a, 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 talks about what the developer's market, go-to-market strategy yeah. is. I if that's in place, yeah. Oracle can have a very robust. Yeah, but we're seeing the, both, the same thing on hardware and software. So hardware, build your own, is starting to get out of vogue. You know, less and less popular buying servers and storage and knitting it together. A lot of guys still buy into that, but that market's going down. I think you're going to see the same thing with software and applications. Rather than starting with a blank piece of paper, what are the big chunks of enterprise functionality that I can grab out of the box and build the thing Reuse that I need? Reuse pre-existing applications. Yes. Yes. Hey, everybody's talking about business capabilities, right? Right. And the idea is a business capability is the activities, the things that I have to do to perform the activities mm -hmm. that my business needs. And those activities are people and increasingly software. Yep. And being able to grab those capabilities, yep. big parts of it from the industry, yep. weave them together quickly, continuously sustain yep. the match with the marketplace, to your point. Well, we're going to have Juan Luiz on next, and we're going to go deep on this, but I think that... Juan's is, a great guy. The API economy, if anything showed us one, security is foobard yeah. and needs to be fixed fast. Yeah. And the, the encryption on a chip thing's been downplayed. I don't know why Fowler's not getting more airtime on that. That's a really huge thing. But the API economy has proven that this ability to pull stuff that someone else has already done, not assembling like a junkyard kind of you know, no, situation. But, but clean, Why build it if someone's got it, I can get it through yeah. an API. Like you, you talk about human capital management, right? Well, you know, there's 175 functions, I don't know, some large number of functions there. They're fine. I need this one little thing, so I'm just going to extend it and still do it in such a way and that a I'm developer who does that becomes a feature in a bigger Ecosystem. pie. Yeah. So yeah. He'll make more money, doesn't go out of business, yeah. doesn't try to go public. So I wanted to share before we wrapped up, one interesting thought, we all talk about cloud is coming, cloud is coming. I actually got tangible evidence at the beginning of the year that it's here. So uh, a new word was given to me, cloud quotas. Cloud quotas. And it was kind of funny, this is happening mostly in the larger banks. Senior management, executive management, you're a little slow on this cloud thing, let me help you out. We'll set a strategic objective five years from now, how much will be cloud spend. This year, your cloud quota is 15% between cloud and non-cloud spend, next year, et cetera. And I think what we're seeing is that uh, kind of like the gears are starting to rub between the business that says, guys, this can't be so hard, let's get on with it. I'm sure it. your sales guys have cloud quotas too. Different kind of cloud <laughs> quota, different kind of cloud quota. No, but on that point, yeah. uh, 20 years ago, yeah. uh, when it became very popular to pay executives on the basis of Rona, yeah. you know, return on net assets, yeah. it was right about that time that outsourcing got popular. Shocking, isn't that? Hey. <laughs> You're a mess for less, right? Hey, sounds like cloud. <laughs> okay, bottom line, for the folks at home, Oracle's infrastructure, stuff that you were involved in, is not new, but it's growing now because it didn't have a lot of nurturing. It was always kind of like that back office secret sauce. We want to What's give, the update? Give a quick update. We want to give people a strategy for their enterprise applications for cloud. If they want to consume on-prem, great. Engineered systems, cloud equivalents. You want to consume off-prem, same set of capabilities and more in our public cloud. You want to consume the public cloud in your data center, that's a cloud machine. And it ought to be the technology stack and the set of capabilities. The geographical location, the consumption model really shouldn't matter. And when we put this in front of large IT shops, even smaller ones, they're like, this is great. I can build my architecture, I can build my strategy. I don't have to make a cloud decision now, and if I do make one, I can undo it later. That agility is becoming very
very, very attractive. I can invest in options and have a future. Yep. Chuck Hollis, Senior Vice President of Infrastructure, congratulations. And then Larry Ellison kind of got to the end of his keynote, didn't have a lot of time, but there was a lot of meat on the bone in the keynote. Holy that he moly. Kind of, That's like, he couldn't hit. It's like, welcome to the cloud. Too many product announcements. Welcome to Amazon's world. I mean, that's Amazon. Sam's excited. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff coming down. It was great talking to you guys. Thanks, Thanks for, for time. sharing your insight and the data and the bits here. Here at theCUBE, we're always sending out the packets of content out to the network, live, original content. I'm John Furrier, Peter Burris, with SiliconANGLE, the Cube. We'll be right back with more live coverage after this short break. Hi, I'm John Furrier, the co-founder 